Boundary layers don't just occur in spatial structures. That's one thing we've been talking about is these singular perturbed uh, differential equations in which you drop out the top derivative and you get some very interesting dynamics, including these boundary layers that form in, in, in boundary, layer prob boundary value problems. However, that same kind of dynamics can happen with temporally dependent differential equations, so time dynamics. And these are often come into play when you have things like initial layers or limit cycle behaviors. So what I want to show here is an example of the same boundary layer phenomena occurring now in time. So transition regions in time in which essentially the physics, the dominant balance physics changes. And so all the same things we did before, which is trying to understand dominant balances, distinguishing limits, are going to come into play in terms of initial value problems. And so, and, and I'm going to show you this in terms of the context of a, of a limit cycle problem. So, uh, temporal boundary values layers, that's, that's what we're really after here. And this can happen either oftentimes when you have an initial layer to a problem, so a very rapid transition at the beginning of the dynamics, and also in what's often called relaxation oscillations, in which you have uh, some kind of strongly nonlinear oscillator which produces uh, dynamics that can change rapidly over a short per period of time and then have a slow dynamics and then another rapid transition. Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to cover in the example for today. Okay, so all the same ideas are going to hold for boundary layer theory, it's just that now these layers are happening in time, rapid transitions in time, where the dominant balance physics changes. So here's going to be the example I'm going to give. It's, it's called the Rayleigh oscillator. It's very much like the Vanderpool in the sense that you have a limit cycle that's exhibited here where this middle term, if the amplitude's too large, it acts like a damping. If the amplitude's too small, it acts like uh, exponential gain. Okay, so the epsilon here is now though going to be in front of the highest derivative. So the epsilon UTT, you have this middle term here where there's a cubic, so this is a fully nonlinear problem. If you look back at what we did with boundary layer theory, those were pretty much just linear problems with non-constant coefficients. Here it's a fully nonlinear problem, plus u equals to zero with some initial conditions. Second order equation. So the initial conditions are A and B, and right away you could see that there could be an initial layer in time happening because if you set epsilon to zero, this drops out and you get a first order differential equation which only needs one initial condition to solve it. But of course I have two, and so this makes this problem singular just as the boundary value problems were. So how do we go about solving this? So the first thing we want to do is sort of try to simplify this up a little bit. And I'm going to define a new variable v, which is du dt. And then you can write down that, that, that second order differential equation as a system of two first order equations. And it's given by here, du dt equals to v. That's by definition. And then dv dt, which was the second derivative before, has the epsilon in front of it. And now the right hand side is v minus 1 third v cubed. This is my those are the terms that were my nonlinear damping terms in the oscillator, and then u on the other side. So I've written this down in the phase plane variables. And you can see where the epsilon sits, it's right there. Okay? So one way to think about that epsilon is uh, epsilon, if it, you have epsilon in front of this time derivative, it means this, this thing here is potentially changing slowly in time, right? So this is an oscillator where you have a slow time variable in, involved in it, in a fast time variable, as we're going to see. So it's a multiple scale problem, and we're going to have to essentially get after this by doing multiple, kind of, multiple scale expansions to, to essentially resolve the inner layer where the, the, the dynamics changes very rapidly and the physics is different. By the way, in parametric form, I can just divide these two equations against each other, and this is what you get. epsilon dv to u is equal to v minus v cubed over 3u over divided by v. And this gets us a lot of information because I want to start first of all representing this in the phase plane. And in the phase plane it is a parametric representation and that's its parametric form. So I could always just say well if I want to represent that let's just look at the outer solution which is epsilon goes to zero. 
And if that's the case, then that derivative drops out, and I just get this cubic equation I have to look at. So that's my outer solution. My outer solution, just like before, just simply do an expansion, and you know, at leading order, the epsilon term drops out, and at that leading order, here's what you get. Your, you, this is your leading order solution for this time-dependent problem. V naught minus V naught cubed over three minus U over V naught equals to zero. And so you find here that U, and actually I should have expanded U as well to be U naught, so this would be U is equal to V naught minus one-third V naught cubed. This gives you a relationship between U and V. And you remember that U is the solution, V was du dt, the derivative of the solution, and here is the relationship for the outer solution. So this is a cubic uh, polynomial that you have here. And if we were to draw this in the phase plane, here's what it would look like. This is the outer solution. It's this curve here, which is a cubic. There it is, like this. That's what I'm just plotting here. And a couple interesting places on this curve that I want to highlight for you. One is these turn points. This one happens here at negative 2 thirds minus 1. This one here happens at 2 thirds 1. So I get this dynamics where along this, dv du is 0. In other words, you know, this is basically essentially steady state type solutions that you have in your problem. Okay? Is on that curve prescribed by this, by this cubic. Okay? And this curve will play a really important role in the overall dynamics, and it is essentially the backbone on which all the dynamics happens. So there it is. And now what I want to start to do is start looking at the dynamic behavior with, with regard to this. And there's going to be two points I'm going to look at, v equals 1 and v equals minus 1. Let me go back and show you where those are. v equals 1 is a line that goes straight across here, right? So th this is at v equals 1. So it's the horizontal line that cuts across from the top to the bottom here. v equals minus 1 is right here, and it cuts across from top to the bottom here as well. So what I want to know is, along the line v equals 1, v equals minus 1, what is the flow field doing? What are the dynamics doing along those lines? So I'm going to come back and do this and just say at v equals 1, I just plug that in to my dv dt equations. So I have epsilon dv dt, plug in v equals 1, I get plus 2 thirds minus u. And at v equals minus 1, minus 1 is epsilon dv dt is minus 2 thirds minus u. Okay? So what's the deal here? So this here is positive or negative depending upon if u is bigger than 2 thirds or smaller than 2 thirds. This here, same thing. When is this positive? When is this negative? So I'm looking to see when is dv dt positive or negative. It's for y, uh, for negative, less than negative 2 thirds or greater than negative 2 thirds. And actually, sh that should be u. Sorry about that. So, let me just show you the plot of this. So along this curve, here's the v equals 1 curve, and I'm looking at dv dt. In other words, that's going to be what's the flow across that line, v equals 1. And notice it's positive here, negative there. And on this bottom line, it's positive here, negative here. So this is setting up a very interesting structure for us to understand the dynamics of what happens. All the flow in this region over here comes up and gets sucked onto this solution curve here. And on the solution curve, you actually flow this direction very slowly. That's the next order correction. So it's not at leading order. Leading order, you just simply get sucked into here. At order epsilon, you flow along here all the way until you hit here. At this point, you fall off that curve. And in fact, over here, the flow is all down here and lands you here. So this is what this is showing. You kind of follow this off, and you very quickly come down to this curve, and then you flow slowly along here, and then you fall up to here. So this is starting to highlight what actually is going to happen in the development of a limit cycle. You're going to have a slow evolution along here. That's the next order correction. A very fast, rapid transition here until you hit the steady state solution here. And that has a slow evolution along here. And then when you hit here, you come up here. So this is sort of giving you an idea of the overall dynamic properties of what goes on in this nonlinear flow field.
okay? And what it shows you is this idea that you can imagine being on a limit cycle, being basically sucked onto this thing and just staying on there. If your amplitude, because remember, this branch here is unstable. So if you're here, you pop up to here. If you're just below this curve, you pop down to here. Okay? So that's what we want to try to understand. How do we understand then solutions and this limit cycle behavior that has a slow physics followed by a fast physics, followed again by a slow physics, followed by a fast physics? And what are the pieces that make that up? And notice a couple things uh, before I guess move away from here. This is a fast field, which is going to be our inner variable. And right here, when the inner variable, the dynamics comes and hits the slow field, this is where I have a matching region. This is where the inner solution matches the outer solution, which is this here. So I'm going to have to patch those together there. I'm going to have to have a, a, a matching region there, and match asymptotic expansions here. I'm going to have to have one here as well. This is where the outer solution hits this fast region. Here, fast region hits the slow region. Slow region hits the fast region. So I have four matching regions at each of these corners of this limit cycle in this phase plane. I'm going to have to match the solution in those four places using matched asymptotic, asymptotics that we used before for our boundary layer theory. So let's go about trying to get this. So let's first of all, I already have the outer solution. So let's try to talk about what does it mean to have an inner solution. And what I'm going to do for the inner solution is do this kind of expansion here. C is equal to u minus 2 thirds epsilon. So what I'm doing here then is, sorry, is expanding along here. Remember, this is, this is at x, you know, this is the value 2 thirds, u is 2 thirds. So what I want to do here is say, I want to expand in a region right here near this 2 thirds. Okay, so I'm going to do that region and expand it. Look there locally, just like we did before with boundary layer theory, except for now I'm expanding this u there. And so I do this expansion like this. U is, C is equal to u minus 2 thirds over epsilon. I can plug that back into my governing equations, which is the system of equations. Uh, or, and there, here's what I get. First of all, I get my chain rule. There it is, first derivative, second derivative. And then uh, I can actually solve here. This is the dominant balance. So once I put this in here by doing, redoing this, the dominant balance is given right by here. Okay, so actually these are the derivatives. And then I can find that u is equal to 2 thirds. And, and by the way, actually, I'm just rewriting this here. So if I take the epsilon over, take the 2 thirds, I have what u is in terms of epsilon c. I'm going to have to use that in my expansion. So I redo this scaling. And here's what I get for the inner dynamics. I rewrite the inner dynamics now, which was dv du, in terms of dv dx. And this is what I get here. Notice I have an epsilon over there. This is where the epsilon showed up now. Okay, I've rescaled this, so I've, I essentially expanded this region. And before, where there used to be an epsilon in front of this, I now have you know, looked at this inner variable done a rebalancing, essentially a different dominant balance, a different distinguished limit, and it pushes the epsilon over to there. Now I can expand. So now I'm going to do some asymptotics to get an approximation to the leading order solution of this inner variable, where all this fast physics is happening. So there you go. There's the leading order solution. Uh, and that's what I need to solve. So I have that as my leading order equation, and I can actually solve this. And, and this is not that hard to do it with differential equations. You take this to the other side, dc to the other side, you integrate both sides, and this is your solution for the inner variable. Okay? And it has some constants. Look, there's the c over here. And so now you have these constants. The solution is well behaved. And so now you have to determine the constants by doing matched asymptotics, right? So this solution holds in that small regime when it goes from the top of the limit cycle down to the other branch of solutions. In other words, it holds from here going down to here. So what I've really done is constructed that solution. In that small region, I've expanded it out. I have the governing equations for that. I already have the slow dynamics, which is what happens along here. 
and what happens along here. I got that side. You could also do this side if you wanted. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. You can just expand around there to get it. And then here's the last thing you need to do. Then you need to match. And I'm not going to go through this because there's four regions to match it in, which is the four corners where the slow and fast physics meet, right? Which is right here, right there, right there, and right there. So you'd have to do matching at these four regions to piece together the entire limit, circ limit cycle solution in an asymptotically correct way. But you do have fast physics and slow physics, and they're different. They have different balances, different dominant balances, and we have that. We got the solutions, and we can match them. What does the solution actually look like? Well, if you just then run simulations of that system, here's the kind of dynamics what you see. Here's the dynamics as you, know, as you go from a smaller epsilon to a very, from an epsilon like, I can't remember what the value is here, but as I make small, epsilon smaller and smaller, so this is a very small epsilon, you can see the very sharp transitions that occur in the dynamics, then slow, and then very fast dynamics. And here's what it looks like in the phase plane. And remember, these are the boundary layers, the initial layer, they are time layers. They're equivalent to the boundary layers, except for now they're happening in time, right? These very rapid transitions here and here, and that corresponds to these very fast jumps right here. So you go in on the slow cycle, then you very rapidly decrease to here. Then slow dynamics, very rapid dynamics. Slow dynamics, rapid dynamics. These are called relaxation oscillations. And using this method of boundary layer theory, we can come and try to understand fundamentally the dynamics that drives this. And essentially what it's telling you is that you have a certain set of physics here on the slow side, and you have a different set of physics on the fast side. In other words, the dominant terms that are generating the slow and fast behaviors change right at these points that are at the edges of the fixed points here, right? Right, right here where the solution, there's a saddle, like there's a turnaround of the slow solution. You move to the fast solution and your, your dominant balance physics changes. And so this is one way to understand what happens in such structures. There's actually a lot more interesting things that can happen in these limit cycles, uh, but we won't talk about it so much here. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of asymptotics and perturbation theory you need to be able to sort of understand it and characterize it by doing these expansions.